Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another great guest this week. She is the former U.S. Women's Chess Champion. Uh, These days, she's also a lecturer at the University of Texas at Dallas, where uh, she has a Ph.D. in education, and she has written seven chess books and writes for U.S. Chess and other well-known chess online entities. Uh, So Dr. and WIM Alexi Root, thank you for joining us this week. Thank you. Let me clarify one thing. My PhD is from UCLA, but I do work for UT Dallas. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I knew that I may have misspoken, but hopefully, um, you know, it wouldn't be my first error and won't be my last. So, um, but th- thanks for the clarification. And we were talking or emailing back and forth a little bit about UTD because as we record, we're recording this Sunday night and the final four of chess here in the United States just took place, which for those who don't know, um, mimics the college basketball final four in the, the top four um, chess teams in the United States get together and play a uh, tournament, a little tournament to see who the collegiate champion is. And uh, I know that you had a rooting interest in this. So did you did you catch any of the action? I know it was in New York, but were you uh, watching from your home in Texas, Alexi? Absolutely. I was watching online, very excited. And uh, you, your listeners probably know by now that UT Rio Grande Valley won with an impressive score of nine points out of 12 possible because there's three rounds and – Four students play each round, so maximum is is 12 possible, and and they got nine. So just a commanding performance. Congratulations to them. Yeah, and UTD got second. Is that right? I wish. UTD got third. So with six and a half points, Webster was second, Webster University. And then Uh, five and a half points was UT Dallas, and three points was Harvard. Okay. And of course, we've had uh, guests from, I believe, every program. I think that uh, Grandmaster Mauricio Ruiz went to uh, UT Rio Grande, if memory serves. And of course, John Bartholomew is one of the many chess players who went to UT Dallas. Um, And uh, which one am I forgetting already? Uh, Oh, Webster, of course. The fabled Webster has had so many strong chess players, but uh, Eric Rosen among, I mean, he's not the strongest, but one one that I'm the friendliest with um, is one of the many Webster U uh, players who who has passed through there um, as these chess powerhouses are built up. So Alexi, um, what is, so we were, again, this is something that we emailed about a little bit, but so, uh, we know that you're a lecturer at University of Texas at Dallas. So, um, do you are you involved with the chess program at all? Uh, let me just backtrack to your last point. Have you ever had anyone on from Harvard? Because remember, they were in the. Oh well, I've had Christopher Chabri, who, uh, you know, he went to Harvard, and um, and I'm guessing he played on the chess team. I mean, he was a he was a master, and he's a. Uh, you know, he's not a young Turk. He's older like us. So that was back when being a USCF master meant that you were probably going to be one of the stronger, strongest players at your college. Uh, so I am guessing that he played for the Harvard chess team, but um, we will have to, we will have to fact check that with him. Um, he's probably going to listen at some point. So he'll, Chris, let us know. Okay, great. Well, that sounds good. And so I'm sorry, you were going to ask me about the chess program at UT Dallas? Well, yeah, yeah. How I know that you said that you have friendly relations with them and that you help them with some stuff. So what's uh what like uh what's your relation with them? Okay, well, actually when I first started at UT Dallas from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand three, I was the associate director of the chess program in charge of recruiting. But then in two thousand three I, I, I left that position, which was a volunteer position. Uh, and just concentrated on my actual job, which is teaching education courses for interdisciplinary studies at UT Dallas. However, my courses are about chess and education. So whenever the chess team 
has a pep rally or has the Chess Educator of the Year event or has coming up this Thursday an intramural tournament, I offer my online students, because all my students are online, extra credit to show up in person at these events. And I show up too because I want to meet my students in person and I love the chess program events that are put on. Okay, so you've been there for a long time. Was, was the UTD program fairly new at that point? That's a great question, yes. It started in 1996. So okay. in 99, it was still pretty new. Yeah, I remember, so I went to college in 1995, and my good friend Greg Shahadi got a scholarship to UMBC, although he only went there for less than a year. And that was back, That was they were sort of at the vanguard. I mean, I remember it was UMBC and then University of Texas at Dallas, and now there's so many schools, especially in Texas and St. Louis, uh, supporting chess. So do you remember many details about how the program came into um came into being? Uh, well, actually, it's easy for your listeners because on our UT Dallas chess program webpage, there's a, a link called history. But just briefly, um, Tim Redman, who's also a former U.S. Chess Federation president, is a literary studies professor at UT Dallas. And some students approached him just to start a chess club. But Tim Redman is a visionary. And he didn't see just a chess club. He saw an entire chess program. And that's, uh, along with UMBC, we, UT Dallas and UMBC really were the top college teams for quite a few years. And as you pointed out, now there's so many. Yeah, not just so many, but they're so strong. I mean, just grandmaster after grandmaster. Uh, it's great. I mean, it's great to see. I agree. It, it really uh, gives K-12 through students here in the United States and internationally, a chance to have what only athletes or maybe other prize recruits had before, which is a chance to go to university, all expenses paid because of one's chest. And that being said, you also have to meet the college entrance requirements for whatever college you're entering. But Still, it's very exciting, I think, for chess players to have the opportunities that uh, people in athletic sports have. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's such a life-changing opportunity. I mean, I can just think of a few guests that, that I've had on the show. And again, there have been so many that have uh, made their way to the United States thanks to these chess programs. But again, Mauricio Ruiz, uh, it certainly uh, when, when I got a chance to interview him, he talked about how it was a life-changing opportunity for him. Elshan Moradi Moradi Abadi, sorry, Elshan, um, uh, as well. And the list goes on. And of course, there are so many um, strong players who I haven't had a chance to talk to that I would love to about um, the the opportunities it presents. And, uh, you know, just getting to go to New York for a weekend, as as these players did. I mean, they had Irina Crush and Maxim Delugi announcing for U.S. Chess uh, these last couple of days. And uh, beautiful weather. I'm not too far from New York, so I can attest they had some beautiful weather. Uh, hopefully got to enjoy that a little bit. So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, hopefully this is only the beginning of even more and more chess programs um, uh, building up. I know that uh, Christian Carrilla has now been hired by University of Missouri. So uh, they're, they're, it'll be interesting to see what they do in terms of building a program. Well, they have $800,000 from Rex Sinkfeld to start their program. Ah, mystery solved. <laughs> Thank I you for... Uh, well, yeah. I can't say... I can't say that that's a huge shock, but I did not know that. Oh, okay. And let me give you a little bit of trivia. Christian Chirilla, who's at University of Missouri, Columbia, and Alejandro Ramirez, who's at St. Louis University as a coach, and Julio Zadora, who's at UT Dallas as a chess coach, all took my online courses back when they were students. Ah, Dallas. okay. Yeah, small world. All UTD alums, correct? That's correct. Oh, yeah. I mean, just so many... Um, uh, influential and strong chess players uh, have passed through uh, through UTD, and as it turns out, have taken your courses. So, what's the? So, you say you have a PhD in education, and your your classes are multidisciplinary studies. Is that right? Uh, interdisciplinary studies. It's a division of the university. Uh, some schools call it general studies, but uh, that's 
my dean is the dean of interdisciplinary studies. That's who I work for. And education courses come under his purview. And so my courses are education courses with a focus on how chess can be used as an educational tool. Okay. Um, and so, and why is it that these courses are conducted primarily on online? Is it to, to reach a wider base of students? Well, initially, when Tim Rendon was still director of the chess program, there was an organization called UT Telecampus, which was to offer online education at all the different UTs, because you may know UT Austin, UT Dallas, UT Arlington. There's a whole system of University of Texas University. So UT Telecampus came and uh, made a presentation at our, our university in 2001 saying that they wanted to develop online courses. And they described what would be an ideal online course. And Tim Redman and I were sitting in the presentation, and we looked at each other, and we thought, chess. So we actually got a $50,000 grant to develop the courses and offer them through UT Telecampus. Well, UT Telecampus has gone away, and now each university in the UT system offers their own online learning. And so now my courses are offered through UT Dallas eLearning. But that's how it got started as an online course, is we had a grant. Okay, that makes sense. And how did you take an interest in, I mean, I know how you took, I, I've read some of your writing about how you got into chess as, as a girl, um, and, and your experiences becoming a strong player and going on to win the U.S. championship, but how did you get interested in education? Well, that's a good question, too. Um, I did try law school for a while because both my parents are lawyers. My dad was a dean of a law school and he was also a professor of law. And my mom went to law school late in life. So I kind of just perhaps due to a lack of imagination thought, well, I should be a lawyer right. too. Uh, but that wasn't a good fit for me. And so then I was kind of casting around for what to do. And I uh, decided to go into teaching which I'd already done some chess teaching, and so I found that I also liked teaching other subjects. So I became a social studies and English teacher at the high school level for a couple of years before I went for my PhD. Okay, and were you doing any chess teaching like at that time? Did you do programs at the schools or not at, not at that moment? When I was a high school teacher at Bakersfield High School in California, shout out to the drillers, that's <laughs> nice. their, their symbol is that oil derrick, you know, because there's oil there. So anyway. Okay. Bakers or there was at least. Thrillers, so. Yes. Um, I did run the after school chess club. So I was doing chess in that sense. And I was I actually a pretty active player uh, while I was a high school teacher as well. Okay. And these days, do you do, do you do much in the way of uh, like school programs? I mean, I know you've written a lot about kids in chess. Um, <laughs> And uh, chess education, but but besides uh, your 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 role for UTD, do you do anything with uh, the young, even younger uh, students? Yes, I think it's good for me to keep myself fresh about what younger students are like. So in the summers, I teach at summer chess camps, and those have ranged in age from you know five and six years old up through uh, around fourteen years old. So I do teach in that. Uh, in that capacity in the summers. Okay. And, and you've written a lot about uh, chess, chess education, the, the benefits of chess, how chess um, can be used uh, in, in different fields. Do you, do you have any, any current projects? I mean, I know you, you mentioned you're headed to, to the U S junior high nationals shortly, but are, are you working on anything writing wise right now? I right now I've been, writing articles as ideas come to me, but I'll have to tell you that one of my students last semester, I can back up and tell you a little bit about my two courses because that might make this next story make sense, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so my first course, ED4358, is students writing lesson plans that include chess, and then they reflect on those plans. And in both of my courses, they have to play chess with each other and notate and annotate. But so the basic idea of the first chess course, 4358, is 
writing lesson plans, teaching those lesson plans, and then reflecting on how it went. Uh, the second course, ED 4359, is to either begin a chess program at an institution or suggest improvements to an existing chess program. So last semester, an ED 4359 student happened to be a parent of a Head Start child, and she got wrote her whole paper about let's introduce chess at Head Start, and actually got, she got so excited about it, she arranged a meeting uh, for me with the, the top officials of Head Start Greater Dallas. So I don't know if anything will come of it, but if it does, my next effort might be chess four and five year olds. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Head Start. Wh what is that for? Um, I, it's one of those things. First of all, I should know what it is, but I'm sure there are a few listeners like me uh, as, as unaware as I am. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry about that. So actually your, one of your prior guests, Elliot Neff has worked with Head Start in Washington state. It's a federal program for three to five year old children. So preschool children. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what the income guidelines are for it. I think it is aimed to give lower income children a head, quote unquote, head start on being successful students once they enter kindergarten through 12th grade. So, oh. yeah, I, I hope that answers it. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where it's like it's a, I, uh, that would have been my guess, but I wasn't positive, and I figured I'm not the only one. So, um, yeah, and I do remember Elliot Neff talking about uh, the developing the curriculum for for very young, very young kids. And obviously, as you say, like uh, being a national program, that that's a big deal if that if that comes to fruition. And I'm sure it would would keep you quite busy. Well, Elliot has done some wonderful work with that up in Washington State, and I definitely was in touch with him via email when Head Start Greater Dallas showed an interest. So Head Start of Greater Dallas is still deciding whether or not they want chess. They're considering it. And then once they decide, they'll have to decide, should we go with Elliot Neff's curriculum that he's already developed, or do we want something local here? And so it's just something exciting to think about. I don't know what will ultimately come out of it, but in terms of a big project, if that actually comes through, that would be pretty big. <laughs> Even if yeah, and I was only an evaluator say if they did adopt Elliot Neff's curriculum and I was brought in to evaluate how it went, that's still a big project. So, Yeah, it definitely is. And I'm sure you have at least some experience writing and working with younger kids. Do you have sort of a framework in mind of what, what your major points would be? Like what, what advice? I, we have a lot of chess teachers, of course, who listen to this show and I, I work with some younger students as well. So uh, what advice do you have for people who are teaching like really young, say, uh, four to six year old students? Well, and you probably already do this, but start with just one or two chessmen at a time. For example, maybe just rooks and kings, and you can spend time with what is check, what is checkmate. You can set up skewers with rooks and kings. So just keeping it very simple at the beginning. And uh, there's definitely some great resources out there for teaching younger children. Is that what you've been doing with the younger ones? Is that uh, just limiting it to a couple pieces at a time? Yeah, I try to keep things as simple as possible. But um, yeah, where I think I need to improve is uh, the mini games. I mean, because it's just, it takes so long for them to be able to move at that age, all of the pieces that, that I, I need to up my mini game game for them in terms of like little activities that they can do. Because with older kids, you can give them very directed puzzle sheets, even even seven-year-olds, but but younger kids, a lot of them can't read. And even when they can read, there's something very daunting about handing them a piece of paper and wanting them to come follow the instructions. So I try to steer away from that, and that leaves like a small small void to be filled. Yeah, I agree. And uh, some of my books have those type of games. Like you probably already do a pawn game, which is just pawns against pawns, and whoever promotes first wins. You know, that's it. The end. <laughs> just see what happens. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, those, I do have some of those already in, in my books. And so I think that they could be adapted for the pre-K set. So, 
Well, yeah, and of course the the steps method is full of full of ideas as well. Yeah. So, um, you have more questions about the other things? Well, I have a related question. I'm sort of rattling around. I know that recently um I Elizabeth Spiegel, a friend of mine who I'm sure you know as well, posted uh that she'd done a speech down and I it was at UTD, correct? That's uh just for chess educator of the year. Yes. Yes. And I, I know that uh, Jeff Bullington, who was featured on 60 Minutes, did it in the won it in the past. Uh, do you do you get a chance? You you inter- did you introduce her? Or am I making that up? I was there. I did not. Introduce OK. Her, oh, right. But I was definitely I'm there not- and I'm going to be actually I've already turned it in. I wrote an article about her presentation for the May issue of Chess Life. OK. Good. Yeah. It deserves a wide audience. It was a great presentation. I agree. It was a really great presentation and it was very well attended because she is a chess celebrity with Brooklyn Castle. So uh, I've, I've been able to go to every one of the chess educator of the year evening. And that was again, something started by Tim Redman that back in 2004 was the first chess educator of the year at UT Dallas. Yeah, well, good for him. It's a great, great initiative. Um, yeah, and the the speeches are online, so listeners, I'll uh, I'll link to a couple of them um, in the show description. So, uh, so Alexi, I know we've got a few topics that that we need to hit. So, you're heading to the the junior high nationals as part of um, the um, initiative to promote uh, chess to to scholastic girl players. That's right. I noticed that the National Junior High was in Grapevine, Texas, which is right around the corner from me. And I become aware that Girls Club rooms are offered at all the National Scholastics. So I emailed with the Women's Committee Chair, Maureen Grimaud, and asked if I could be a special guest for the Girls Club room at the National Junior High. And I'm excited that she said yes. So along with Katerina Nemkova, we're the two special guests for that girls club room. Cool. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And Katerina, I I haven't met her in person, but I've had very good interactions with her online. So uh, shout out to her. I think that uh, the the young girls there will be in good hands. And and listeners, take note of uh, Dr. Alexi Root, PhD and former uh, U.S. Women's Chess Champion. She's she's still a go getter, still going to to get that opportunity for herself and offering your her services, not not waiting to be summoned, right? Oh, oh yeah, uh, you can't wait to be summoned, that's for sure. And as long as I was going <laughs> to the girls' club room, I, I kind of went a little overboard, maybe in in what I've taken on because I'm also doing a book signing Saturday from four to six. And I asked Melinda Matthews, the editor of Chess Life, can I write the report on the tournament? So we'll see if I'm able to juggle all these varying roles. But I'm I'm very excited to try. Yeah, it's great. And I, I'm I'm pretty excited about all, all the initiatives they're doing in, in women's chess. And obviously that's a topic I've, you know, talked about with, with various guests so um over the years that I've been doing this podcast but one thing i'm curious about with with your perspective alexi having you know been a strong player um coming up and then seen different generations come up do you have any theories so we know that the chess world hasn't been as welcoming to to women as men over the years but but do you have any theories for for do you think that women are less interested in chess to begin with or do you think that they get turned away um as as if their interest is initially peaked? Well, that's a great question. I I think that they there's a huge drop-off of both boys and girls right around age 14. So both, you know, that I was just looking at some statistics. Did you know the, the peak year for being a U.S. chess member is age 10? Like, that's the peak. And then it drops. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, um, but I do think that it tends to drop off more for girls because if you see fewer girls around and you have less friends in chess, then, you know, as time goes on, if you're like 
you may be one of several girls playing at your elementary, but then if you get to middle school or high school and you're the only girl, that may not be as comfortable or pleasant a situation. And there's so many other options for children in high school that I think it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to retain the interest at that point. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say the age of 14, because I was thinking, when you said it, I was thinking in my experience with with girls, it might be a little earlier, I was thinking around 12. But then as I think about it, of course, like, uh, girls hit puberty at a younger age than than men. So I don't know how much that has to do with it. But it's at least a possibility that in addition to there being especially historically, but even now, uh, fewer fewer girls playing to begin with. But then, as you say, when it starts to drop off, I think it takes um, a, either a burning passion for the game or uh, a strong, strong uh, self, strong personality in order to stick with it at that point. Although it's, you know, it's great that th- these initiatives, I think, will definitely help. I, I think so, too. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens to those statistics over the next few years because, you know, we can we can look and see if there's more retention or growth or all those things. And Jennifer Shahade is the Women's Chess Program Director for U.S. Chess, so she's going to be pushing this mission, and, we'll, and there's a very active women's committee. So we'll see what happens. It, it'll be interesting. Yeah, it w- it will be. What changes have you seen over over your life in terms of uh, how women are received in the chess world? Hopefully, hopefully you've seen some. Well, in terms of prize money, because that's something measurable, I guess. When I won the U.S. Women's in 1989, the first prize was two thousand dollars. Now, I do have to say that they paid airfare and fed us and housed us, so. The value of it, I think, is a little greater than 2000 because of all those that was included. And the first prize now for the U.S. women is 25000 But I don't know if they have to pay their own hotel and airfare and everything to get to St. Louis. So, yeah. That's, but, I mean, obviously it's gone up, you know, <laughs> from... Yeah, although I'm, I'm I'm trying to call up like an inflation adjuster because if anything, I given the the more prominent role that uh, women's chess, at least as far as uh, from my perspective, has taken, I might have guessed a bigger difference because I, only because I mean, to, obviously nominally it sounds like a huge difference, but but um, but when you account for inflation, um, I'm curious. So it, it was 1989, is that right? Yes. 30 years. All right, list, listeners, here you go. We're going to get a live calculation from this random website. Okay. <laughs> just because otherwise my curious, my curiosity would uh, would get the best of me. And that, huh. oh, do you, okay. And that price one was actually a big jump up that year. They were hoping to attract some of the recent uh, players that had immigrated to the country to play, but instead they got me winning it. So, <laughs> you know. Okay. Was, well, my math is... Players. Well, I mean, it's still an accomplishment. I mean, anytime you're playing the best players in a in a country, it's uh nothing to to um downplay. Um, but but one could definitely downplay my ability to calculate inflation rates because it turns out that if you bought something in 1989, if if I purchased according to usinflationcalculator.com, um, uh, something a website I never thought I would be name checking on this podcast, but here we are. Um, if you purchased an item for $2,000 in 1989, it would now be 4,000. So obviously that's a huge difference um, from today's prizes. So yeah, that makes a big difference. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, if you just look at an example of uh, is Jennifer Yu who ran roughshod through the tournament this year. Um, uh, she, you know, she got, I saw Mike Klein mentioned she got an almost perfect score on the SATs, uh, obviously going to have a lot of opportunity in, in life. So it'll be interesting to see how big a role chess plays with, with the increased opportunity for women to play chess, but still, I mean, not, she'll have other opportunities as well. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for her and other young talents. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about that because, um, didn't how you fan kind of stop playing chess to go to Oxford or am I misremembering that? 
You are not imagining that. That is a thing that is happening. Yeah. And obviously with state support in China, um, you know, it can be she might be under even less pressure, one would think, financially. But, um, yeah, at least for the time being, she's not a chess professional. It seems like like I know when I talked to uh, Judith today out in the Bay Area, um, she they had her do an event. She still does chess events and stuff. But um, I believe she was invited to the Karen's Cup and, and wasn't able to play. So it's definitely not her focus right now. Well, and if you're saying this about Jennifer Yu being so academically talented too, then, you know, you kind of wonder if how your fan chose academics maybe someone like Jennifer you will as well. So I don't know. It, it is, it is interesting. Um, so many different directions that some of these very talented top women are going to be pulled in as life goes on. Yeah, it is. And I think it's only slightly less stark for, for men. Um, I mean, or, you know, for the population at large, um, if you're, if you're top, obviously if you're top 10 in the world or something, that's the point where, you know, it seems I would question the decision to not pursue chess. But anything short of that, I think that one could make an argument in either direction. Although certainly as a chess fan, I'm always uh, hoping for, for the top players to, to keep playing. Yeah, it's, it can be a hard decision because, you know, if you have other interests or other fields pay so much better, at what point do you stop playing chess all the time. I mean, a lot of people go into chess teaching, but I'm sure, as you know, as a chess teacher, that that's not the same as working on your own game and and playing for yourself. So even going into chess teaching is kind of stepping away from playing. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing about chess teaching is once you attain a level uh, like these players have played, um, whether like even like even in your example, uh, having gotten a PhD in education, but even if you hadn't, you would have had opportunities to teach chess. But when you're young and can can go to um, either get a scholarship somewhere or go to an elite institution or both, that's something that it's best to take advantage of when you're young. And then if you still pursue chess, that's great. But but uh, you you might as well take advantage of the opportunities you have when you have them. Well, that's what's so nice about all these college scholarships available is that it allows these talented young players to keep their hand in in chess and still play top-level competitions like the Final Four of College Chess, but pursue their degrees. So it's really a wonderful, as you said, wonderful opportunity for uh, young chess players. Yeah. And as you say, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve over time, both in terms of uh, what affect these uh, these great initiatives that, that U.S. chess and, uh, you know, other supporters of chess throughout the world have uh, have launched. And and in terms of uh, where these young women and where other top young players end up uh, spending the bulk of their professional time, um, we will stay tuned and track it as the years go on. Um, so, of course, Alexi. As someone who has has heard some interviews on this show, you know we're going to talk chess improvement. So I prepped you and told you I'd be asking for some book recommendations, and I know that you've got a few ready. You were even you even sent me the links in advance. So uh, other prospective guests, take note. Uh, <laughs> Alexi is uh, she's very diligent, and I really appreciate it. So Alexi, what? First of all, let's start with your your playing when you were um, when you were working hard to improve and playing a lot. What were your um, most formative chess books. Oh, see, now I didn't include those in my list. So now <laughs> we'll have to do some work. So It's okay. I'll track them okay. down. Um, actually, I was fortunate enough to be interviewed for Chess Life Kids in October 2018. And so they also asked that, or Melinda Matthews also asked me that same question, which books made an impression on me as a kid. And to be honest, one of the ones that I loved as a child was How to Win in the Chess Opening by I.A. Horowitz. And the re- and there was another book he wrote, too, with the same type of format. And it had what he called movies. Like, it was just diagrams and the moves underneath them. The, but it was, tell- it was a movie of a different opening. That was the, the way he styled it. 
And I just loved it. Interesting. I just love watching that. So could you could you explain that? Uh, I, I don't think I read this. If I did, it was uh, 30 years ago. Um, what do you mean by there were movies of a Chesokee? Well, um, it, it has been a while since I've looked at it, and I don't know right. if I still own it. But what I remember is that you'd have a you know diagram, and I mean, if it was the Roy Lopez opening, Horowitz would make up a like a movie style storyline about the opening, and so you would uh, okay. the opening through the diagrams and and read you know the adventures that happened during this Roy Lopez opening. At least that's how I remember it. So um, that was when I was just starting out. Now my uh, first chess coach, Lauren Schmidt, who was in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, he's an FM. He had me um, working with him on my system during the chess lessons as a nine-year-old. And I remember that <laughs> being really, like, hard work. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and looking back at it, I feel like perhaps maybe he was getting something out of it, too. Like, let me just teach this nine-year-old the thing that I want to study here or something. But, right. but we, we did do some my system, but I would not have put that as, uh, you know my favorite book although I remember about like you know like overprotecting I do remember something about that but um one book I liked as a teenager was Leonid Stein Master of Attack by I think it was Raymond Keen but I'd have to double check that and it was just uh Leonid Stein was died young but he was a great Soviet player and at the time I was playing a lot of um G3 openings and G6 openings for black and he played those openings and he won and I just thought wow this is really exciting so I like that book okay yeah I know that he's um he's like a kind of he's a legend in the chess world I mean he's um yeah one of the what could have been if uh if he had stuck around longer um and what about more up to you know more current uh favorites of yours ah so now so now we get to the list I actually sent you. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'm lucky enough to uh, have occasionally reviewed books, as John Hartman mentioned. And when you review books, publishers send you books for free, which is really exciting to get free books. And a couple of books that were sent to me in that way that I really liked were uh, Judith Polgar, How I Beat Fisher's Record. And that's a 2012 book. And I know there's follow-ups to that book. Like, it, it was the first of her series. But I really enjoyed that book. because her, Yeah, all three of her books are great. All three of those are, are awesome. It's a good combination of, like, memoir and amazing chess. Exactly. I really like books that have uh, narration. You know, stories about chess, stories about biographies of the players, you know. And so... I, and I'm thinking I don't have the Leonid Stein book anymore, but I'm thinking it must have had that for me to be so interested in it. And then these two authors have made a splash recently with their Alpha Zero book, but um, Matthew Sadler and Natasha Reagan's book Chess for Life from 2016. Uh, I got a review copy, and I really enjoyed that book. They had a lot of tips for players in their 40s and 50s and examples and stories and I often think to myself, if I was actually interested in improving my chess, I should go back and study that book because it had tips for what openings you should play and how to approach endgame study. So I was pretty excited about that book. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one as well. So even when I was lucky enough to get them on this show on their little Game Changer press junket, um, I, I wasn't going to let them – I wasn't going to let them – do this interview without uh without talking about that book as well especially because i know the topic of uh adult improvement in chess is is of interest to a lot of listeners to the show as well so alexi i know that you you had kids are your kids grown now or they are they're adults oh you sound so forlorn (laughs) oh yeah yeah enjoy the time i know you have a young child enjoy that time (laughs) It's really- yeah, I've got two young ones, but I mean, often I'm forlorn at the end of the day, too. So, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's uh, wonderful, but exhausting. Uh, but 
But what I was going to ask is, you you say if you were pursuing your chess, and uh, I'm just out of curiosity, do you have any inkling to to get back in the ring and and play again? What's been really nice about this uh, girls and women's chess initiative is that more and more tournaments for girls and women are popping up, and whenever they do, I I feel obligated to support them because I think it is important. So that's actually gotten me playing a little bit more and. What's been neat is that I played in a, a Texas Women's Championship, and the, the four daughters of one of the players, uh, she, the, the mom had me posing for photos with the daughters, and, and they all had lots of questions and wanted my autograph. And so that's nice, but, you know, on an ego perspective, but I also do feel it's important for me to show up at these events to be a inspiration or role model for any younger players that show up. And also, since I'm not at my peak strength anymore, they can maybe even defeat me, and then they can say, oh, I... Right, oh, yeah. 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 So, so I've been playing in those tournaments, and um, if organizers offer me a good conditions at uh, open tournaments, I always jump on that, because I think, well, if they're generous enough to offer me a free entry, then... You know, who am I to say no? That's really nice of them. So that's a hot tip out there for any organizers. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it sounds like you've still got your toe in the water. Well, Just, uh... you know, if, if, uh, if the right opportunities come along, absolutely. I I love playing chess. It's one of the – I I heard you talk on one of the podcasts about how you were very absorbed in a chess book and didn't realize your hotel room was flooding. That's how I feel during chess games. I, I love it. Yeah. I that's just great to be so absorbed in something because in my normal life, which is basically spent online because I teach online, it's so easy to get distracted by, oh, there's a new student assignment that's just been posted or just been emailed to me or, you know, it's just not the same as focusing all in on a chess game. Yeah, you're very you're very responsive to emails, I must say, at least in our uh, handful of interactions. Yes, um, that about me because I, you know, they I promise them turnaround on their assignment within forty eight hours, and I usually do it even faster than that. And they're like, "Wow, we've never had a professor who right. like detailed critiques so quickly." But you know. Yeah, well, there's there's something about the chess player personality, I think, that that goes along with, like, spending a lot of time online. So I just think that there's sort of a natural – now that now that that's an opportunity that's available, you know, now now that spending a lot of time online is, is a thing, uh, I think that naturally, you know, even people like uh, – even people like Hikaru Nakamura is, you know, on the computer all the time, you know, not uh, – not uh, out at the club or anything, anything like that. Um, and yeah, I just think there's something about whatever the the Venn diagram of things that connect chess players. There's there's a strong component of people who who like to be alone in a room, but being online obviously allows you to feel connected and to to pursue your interests as well. That's a good point. Okay, I'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you don't sound so convinced, but that's okay. No, I mean, uh, I think uh, I think uh, that I mean, I I certainly don't mind being alone in a room with and being online because there's so much to keep busy with that. So yeah, I think that's that's a valid point. Okay, I mean, it's just something I've observed in my experience, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I could be wrong. Um, so you also you've written stuff for the pers- from the perspective of a parent and given advice to to chess parents. So I know I I've we have at least uh some chess parents who like to listen to this show. So what what advice do you give to them, Alexi? Well, you know, my number one advice is always think safety. Make sure that you don't leave your child one-on-one with a chess teacher. It's just not a good idea. And then You know, uh, Elizabeth Spiegel gave this advice during her talk, too, which is um, sit in on the prospective teacher's lessons as a parent. Sit in and and observe and maybe try out several different teachers and talk to your child about what's a good fit. So I think uh, that's a start. I don't know what other 
what other other things you want me to mention, but um yeah, I I think that's good advice. I mean for for listeners, I mean you you've been on the you've been on the record writing about um you you were a victim of of abuse as a as a teenager. So just just to I just want to give it a full airing since you've written about it and you've been open about it and I think it's great that that you're an advocate now to to make sure because obviously as a parent that's that's your number one priority is the safety of your child. Yes, and you know, I I have to credit Jennifer Shahade for encouraging me to write about it because as usual, you know, as you said, I like to uh look for opportunities to become involved in chess so and to, you know, get jobs in chess to be frank. So I I had well, after my dad passed away in March of 2017, I wrote to her and I said, can I write a memoir about my life in chess and, and my dad, you know, and aim it for Father's Day? And she said, sure. And so I turned in an initial draft to her, which didn't include the sexual abuse story. All it included was the stories that the story that I told many times before, which was about being stopped at the border between the U.S. and Canada at age 13 with no evidence of who I was and was just a chess clock because I was headed on my Greyhound bus up to a chess tournament. And so she asked me after I emailed in like that much, what happened next? And I decided, and I'd never written about it before. Okay. You know, my dad's passed away now um, because I feel like it's a criticism of him to write about what happened to me because he sent me up there. So I hadn't written about it before, but I went ahead and wrote about what happened over time with the Canadian chess coach. Well, I I commend you for it. I mean, it was a really moving article and, you know, we can't, we can't judge, at least I don't think you parents should be judged with today's safety standards. uh, When, when this took place, you know, decades ago, I mean, even, even when I was a kid, I, I, I remember just, I mean, the whole, the whole culture around uh, how around kids uh, being supervised was entirely different. Um, so I, I, it was a moving memory of your dad, and I, I certainly wouldn't think that it's. I mean, it's awful. I mean, just unspeakably awful w- what you went through. Um, but I don't, I don't know from my perspective. I. Your dad is not the the primary person to to blame for that. Oh, of course not. But I just um, I know that you know he felt some guilt about it. Of course, you know because but for him letting me go up there, you know it wouldn't have happened, right? So while he was alive, I didn't want to bring it back up again. And I really, when I emailed back and forth with Jennifer, I'm like. You know, I don't want to write this if it's going to bring shame on my family. I was really conscious of that. But she was very encouraging. She said, you know, this is an important message for other parents. And so she worked with me, and I I am uh, pleased with the, the final article, which was really framed with what parents can learn from my experience, because there's nothing that I can do to change my past and what happened to me, but if parents listening to this just are more careful about where their children are and who they're with, then that's a good thing, because once you're, once you have that happen to you, it it changes your whole life in a bad way, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully I can help uh, other parents and children avoid what happened to me. Yeah, I think it's, it's quite quite commendable that you wrote about that. And I know that you mentioned in the article that this, of course, also impacted how you how you parented. Um, so um, did you feel like uh, you as a parent, uh, I, I gather you had a different, different approach? Oh, absolutely. I had a very different approach. I mean, my dad, in the article I mentioned, he was kind of a free range. Is that the term free range parenting where Right, yeah, yeah. Just go off. Yeah, versus helicopter. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was much more the helicopter parent. I mean, my children didn't go on overnights. And, like, when my – I volunteered all the time at their schools, and I was always the chaperone uh, on any trip, you know. So I was 
I was definitely right there all the time. And, you know, I've read about um, other people who've gone through this and then become parents, and they also tend to do that because they don't want it to happen to their own child. It's very, a very real thing they're trying to avoid for their own children. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's one of one of the greatest fears of every parent. So it's it's good that, that you make it a point of emphasis right away, because um, sometimes it goes unspoken just because it can be uncomfortable. Um, but but it, it needs to be said. Well, I mean, if you just um, have the, the first criteria when you're choosing any program for a child is safety. And I really like scouting has a good rule of thumb, which is that there, if there's one teacher, there should be two, at least two students in the, you know, and if there's uh, uh, two teachers, then there can be one student. So in other words, you never have one teacher and one student. There's always like two yeah. and one. And that's, I mean, that's not a perfect defense, obviously, but it, it helps. And so, you know, as parents for any program our children are in, just investigate. Is there always you know, two or more adults with the kids, or if there's just one adult, are there multiple children? Like uh, my yeah. kid's not left one-on-one -on -one with that teacher. Yeah, just as a teacher, I I try to always be in that situation just because um, you, you, from all sides, you, you don't, you know, you don't want there to be any misunderstandings. Um, and you, you want to make sure that everyone knows that, that you have a safe environment. So yeah, from, I mean, obviously the, the safety of the kids is, is the paramount concern, but just for, for any chess teachers listening, I think it's a general guideline for, for you yourself to try to make sure that you're always in those situations. Oh, I agree because you don't want to, as a chess teacher, put yourself one-on-one -on -one with a chess student, you know, without, I mean, you know, obviously if it's, where the doors are open and other people can see you, that's different. Like, you know, but you don't want to be one-on-one -on -one with a chess student at your apartment and no one else is there. That's just not a good idea. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So I thank you for uh, being willing to talk about that um, because, you know, I, I've, um, ever since my coming out as a sex abuse survivor, I've tried to make it a point to bring it up um, and, you know, hopefully it helps at least in the chess world. Yeah. Yeah. For, I, I hope so as well. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's just, it's so important because there are so many, there are so many sexual abuse survivors and uh relative to how many there are it is not talked about very much i mean obviously for very understandable reasons but but i mean if this is um something we want to get better over time uh um talking about it i think is is the best i mean a step in the right direction i agree and i have to say though that i was definitely discouraged from talking about it for a number of years so you know i i think that that whole idea of somehow, like if any other crime happens to you, like if someone steals your handbag or breaks into your house or beats you up, like there isn't the stigma, I don't think, of talking about it afterwards. But with this crime, somehow we stigmatize the victim. And it's true. And that, and that makes it harder to talk about. I know uh, when it happened to me and I finally did tell my parents and as I wrote about, um, you know, my dad and I pursued it in front of the chess coaches professional board. Well, I had asked my dad, can we go to open court? Because I was all gung-ho to be like, let's make sure this never happens to another child. And my dad said, well, if we go to open court, your reputation will be ruined. And also, this chess coach's career in his outside profession will be ruined. And so now... You wouldn't think my dad would care about the chess coach's career, but as I started that essay, he was really a defense attorney at heart. And, right. uh, you know, I start with the story that I grew up with, which is that, you know, he defended someone who killed three people and made a paraplegic out of the force and was willing to have that person, Dwayne Pope, come and stay at our house. So he was all about, no matter how awful your crime is, you deserve a second chance. 
and he felt that way about the person that abused me. And that was pretty mind-blowing for me even now that that was one reason we didn't go to open court was, number one, my reputation, which, again, that gives me the message that it's something shameful. If you say, we can't go to open court because your reputation will be ruined. So that gives a certain message. But then also, we don't want to ruin this person's career. So we went for, because of my dad's guidance, we went for going in front of his professional board and certain restrictions were placed on him as he practiced his profession, which was uh, outside of chess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, better better than nothing. I I felt like I did something to help protect other children. And, you know, that was all I could do. I was a minor, you know. Yeah. So I wasn't able to run it the whole show myself in terms of how to proceed. And I am satisfied that at least something was done and maybe that person got the message that he shouldn't do this in the future. You know, that's hopefully so. I don't know. I mean, one never knows, right? What happens. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, at least. And now I'm trying in a different way, which is just getting the message out to parents. Right. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, again, it's um very important message, obviously. Well, Alexi, um, I, I really want to thank you for your time. I don't want to end on, on such a somber note. Um, I mean, I, what, what's that? Uh, I think we had a few other topics, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, for one thing, I know that you had mentioned that you piggybacking off of, uh, what John Hartman talked about last week, you, you mentioned that you, you could share your perspective on, if anyone's interested in uh, finding work in the chess world or how you got your first book published, um, that, that you could tell us about that. Absolutely. So my first book was my, my online courses started in 2001. So when you teach an online course, you have to basically write out all the things you would lecture about in person. So I wrote out the whole course and taught it for five years or actually about four years. And then I realized this could be a book. And I uh, looked around for who could uh, publish it and um, had some rejections. But then I met uh, someone in a book group I was in. I was in a women's book group. And this person in the group, Kate Eaton, had published with ABC Clio, actually a division of ABC Clio. But she had written about uh, life in Russia was her book. And she says, she, I described my book, and she's like, that sounds very interesting. Let me tell my editor about it. And so from that editor, another editor approached me, and that's how the first book got published. So I'd already had it written, which is not uh, completely the normal procedure for a nonfiction book, but that's how my first book got published by ABC Clio, and they write, they're primarily published for librarians and educators. And so I was able to publish four more books with, with them. And then they were like, well, you know, that's probably enough chess and education books because they're kind of competing against each other. Because if you're an educator or a librarian, you might just want one book on chess and education in your library, not five. So I, I kind of, I think, hit my limit with that publisher. Huh. But that's interesting to the the perspective that it was outside of the traditional chess publishers. I mean, we have a few more than we used to, but still it's a fairly short list of chess publishing companies. That's right. It was not a chess publisher. It was, a, as I said, it's a fairly big publisher, ABC Clio, uh, for educators and librarians. And they didn't have any books on chess and education. And they, they got five and... That was enough. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, it was a great experience. And uh, then I ended up writing two more books for a chess publisher called Mongoose Press, which I've enjoyed working with both ABC Clio and Mongoose Press. And what about uh, general <laughs> advice for uh, writing, if people who are interested in writing about chess? Well, I'm going to copy John Hartman's advice. He said to write for your state magazine first. And that you probably won't get paid. And that's true. I mean, I, I wrote for Northwest Chess when I lived up in, because, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska until I was 11. And then my family moved to Washington State. So 
So my teenage years were spent in Washington State, and then so I wrote articles for free for Northwest Chess. And then uh, I moved to Southern California, and I wrote articles for free for Rank and File, which is the Southern California magazine. And then I moved to Texas, and I wrote articles for free for Texas Night. Uh, and I think I also wrote a couple articles for Michigan Chess just because I had played some tournaments up there. But I did a lot of writing for free and then um, had all that experience writing about chess and then was able to write for Chess Life. Okay, so you really paid your dues. For a lot of years, yeah. I think actually one of my first articles for Chess Life was uh, when I was U.S. Women's Champion, they invited me to write like one of the articles at the front of the magazine because they were uh, doing a membership drive. So they had different people every month writing about the membership drive. And I had a clever thing in there where I said, roll your chessboard so the squares face outward so everyone knows you're a chess player. You know, it's just a simple way to publicize chess. Oh, like nice. carrying around your board, don't roll it with the squares inside, roll it with your squares showing. So. Was, yeah, I like it. <laughs> that, that's, that was one of my tips for the membership drive, uh, you know, to be proud you're a chess player and show it off. So I think that was maybe uh, the start of me writing some articles for Chess Life. But now I've, I've written a lot for Chess Life and Chess Life Online and Chess Base, and I write for a site called Spark Chess, which is out of Romania. Um, so I, I keep pretty busy with, uh, with writing various articles, thank goodness, because I enjoy it. And I also do proofreading. I um, proofread for uh, Mongoose Press and for Russell Enterprises, which is Canon and Russell. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Big big publishing. Big um, uh, big chess publishers. Yes, yes. And have you have you uh, come across anything recently? Any uh, Anything in the pipeline? Well, um, the last book I proofread for Russell Enterprises was a book called The Bishop by Sergei Kasparov, not Gary Kasparov, but Sergei Kasparov. And I believe that the bishop is uh, turning into a whole series where each piece is going to get its own treatment. So, huh. yeah. Cool. What's, uh, what's the hook? Well, I mean, the oh. bishop, you just learn everything possible about the bishop, like all the different bishop endgames, like opposite color bishop endgames, same color bishop endgames, Bishops in the middle game, you know, just everything about the bishop. So, wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I enjoyed reading that book. It was really good. So, and it was huh. translated from the Russian. So I was uh, proofreading the translation because I don't speak or read Russian. But then occasionally I'd have a question, and I'd have to go back to the like the Russian and use a Google Translate and try to figure out like was the translation actually representing what this Russian author was trying to say? So that, that was a neat challenge. But, um, you know, uh, in, in, uh, I don't know, would your listeners be interested in how much money all this stuff pays? Or, or is that... The I, I think so, yeah. Okay. So for writing, I generally get about 20 cents a word. It tends to be more for print publications and can be a lot less for some websites, but roughly 20 cents a word. And again, remember, this is after years of not getting paid at all. So, um, and then... So let's see. So if you write like a three-page article, how many words would be... How many words would that be? What do you think? Um, you, you figure about 800 words a page. So. Okay, so 2,400 <laughs> times 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's like 50 bucks, right? For a, for a three-page article? No, I don't. Think oh, okay, yeah. Math right there. No, no, no. Uh, oh man, sorry, it's late here. For five hundred words, it's a hundred dollars. So, and that's like a little more than half a page. So, okay. So twenty cents a word. But okay. And then for proofreading, I started out charging thirty dollars an hour, and now I charge thirty-five dollars an hour. And that's actually, considering I'm a subject matter expert, you know that which is hard to find like a general proofreader who can actually proofread chess books because there's a lot of, I mean, I have to play through the lines and make sure they make sense and that there's not any missing moves. So that's what I, yeah, it's hi highly specialized for, for proofreading. So, uh, and then, you know, 
since I now know I can make $35 an hour sitting at home with my computer doing proofreading, that kind of biases what chess camp teaching jobs I'll take. Because, I mean, I do enjoy teaching in person, but if it's going to be at less than 35 an hour, then I kind of think to myself, well, should I do it or not? And Remember, I'm in. See, we're back. We're back to sit, sitting alone in the room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, all, so, it all comes full circle. Right, right. But I mean, um, rates can vary. I know chess teaching rates, uh, you know, per hour are probably a lot higher where you are. And I mean, for like a group class, I would definitely expect more than thirty-five an hour. If it's like a one-shot deal, like one hour a week after school versus a whole camp day. If that makes sense. Right, yeah, of course. If yeah. Commuting to one school for one hour, that you have to figure that, you know, your commuting time for something too, as opposed to having a whole day of a chess camp. So, you know, that's hopefully that's helpful to your readers or your listeners. I'm so used to writing, sorry, your listeners. Oh no. Did any no, and I do think questions it. or I know we were kind of a I've been kind of a last minute guest, so you may not have gotten any questions in. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get any questions. Our but it's not just you. Our our my Patreon supporters got bust them. I've been slacking lately, so uh, okay. I thought yeah. I was like a last minute substitution. So all right, I won't take it personally. <laughs> no, well you would have been you would have been on sooner or later anyway. But but I mean, um, yeah, there's uh, we haven't been getting a ton of questions lately, which you know, um, well let me who knows tell a story about that though that you that might make you feel good. So, you know, Dan Lucas started the Chess Life podcast, and originally when he started it, he had a trivia contest, uh, and he wasn't getting many people trying for this trivia contest, even though the prize was a $50 gift certificate to U.S. Chess Sales. So all you had to do was answer the trivia question, and you'd win this certificate. So I suggested to him, why don't you be like Ben Johnson? and Perpetual Chess Podcast and have a Best Question Contest. And he did that. He started a Best Question best question Contest where the prize is the $50 U.S. Chess Sales gift certificate. And he says that immediately doubled and tripled the amount of uh, input from his listeners. Like, it was a great idea. So that was good. Well, thank you. You. Glad to hear it. Yeah, and I do enjoy Dan's Dan's uh, podcast, and he, and he gets some good questions submitted as well. Well, you know, he's offering the prize. Now, you're not in the same position he is, so you can't offer a prize, but I'm saying that I stole your idea of questions in, yeah. to him. So. Well, I mean, what I tell myself is just that my, my questions, my own questions are just so amazing that the listeners are just like, I mean, how am I going to top it? There, there's no reason to send in a question. You, yeah, I think, uh, uh, that's uh, really <laughs> true. You know, you, you do ask great questions and you make your guests feel very comfortable, which I appreciate. And uh, I've I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts and just want to commend you on doing such a great job. And it is a great honor to be your guest this time. So thank you. Oh, well, th- thank you, Alexa. Yeah. And if anyone listening is at, uh, at Junior High Nationals uh, coming up in Texas, obviously, uh, let Alexi know that you heard her. And uh, Alexi, other than that, if people want to reach you, um, what, is the, what is the best way for them to keep up with whatever you're doing? Well, I think you're going to put up my Amazon page with all my books, right? So they can. Yes. yes. And that has some of, I try to put my upcoming appearances on that page. And I'm on Facebook, and I accept all friend requests on Facebook. And my um, email is public knowledge at the university there. So, um, and I have a Gmail too. I don't mind giving it, or if you want to put it on, I don't know how you do that on your website. Yeah, whichever you prefer. And which one do I already have? Let's have let's my, start with that. You have my Gmail, and that's fine. You can put that up for people to get a hold of me. That's uh, as opposed to my university uh, email address. So either one works. Okay. All right. Well, it all sounds good. Um, and, and thank you, Alexi. I really appreciate uh, your, your willing to talk about all things good and less good um, uh, from, from your experiences. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we didn't even get to talk to, about some of the other topics. Like 
uh, you know, my chairing the Women's Chess Committee and all the things we did back then. So maybe if I'm very lucky, you'll have me back someday. So I hope. Yeah, sounds sounds good to me. All right, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who makes Perpetual Chess possible. Of course, that includes Matthew Passy, my producer, and Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music. I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show. That includes people who tell their friends, tweet about it, share on Facebook. Apparently, Instagram is a thing. Every little bit helps grow the show. But most of all, I want to thank people who support the show financially. I've said this before, but Perpetual Chess is my most gratifying but least paying work. If everyone who listened to the show were able to kick in $1 a month, it would be my best paying and most gratifying work. So I want to thank those who are able to provide financial support. That includes extra special thanks to Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Dan O'Hanlon, Greg Shahadi, John Jernigan, and Todd Bryant. And I also want to thank all of my Patreon and PayPal perpetual partners. Here comes the list. You guys ready? Here we go. Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Benjamin Handelman, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, I am Carlos Perdoma of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood. Good job, Christophers. I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer. Good job, Daniels. Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith. I am Elect Donnie Ariel Esquire, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Ogar of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Willem, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fartentain, John Hartman, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Namsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovrutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Passi, Martin Habich, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the mysterious Moon Master 9000, Mr. Michael Shahadi, Nate Salon, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek of DiplomatChess.com, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, the law office of Stuart Katz, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Thomas Casper, Thomas Stanek, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com. His book is coming to Chessable. Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrinkush, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thank you, everyone, and I will catch you all next week. Chess 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 Ch